Hey guys, my name is Int80. I'm the rapper in Dual Core. <laughs> I'd like to rap for you to intro this talk. Thanks for coming in. We're going to start with some baseline questions. What's your name and what do you do? I'm Int80. I'm the rapper in Dual Core. Where are you from? Cincinnati. And why are you here? Well, there's plenty of possibilities Explaining my guest appearance Investigating my clearance Up to test my perseverance Basically, I'm here Cause these feds just want to battle me Turning my brain waves Against my DIY mentality Looking for the pattern Of a hacker in the brain I'm monitoring the heart rate Of a rapper in the veins Eyes on the prize While they're mapping all the waves These wires make me feel Like I'm shackled up in chains Keep pace, try to hide a change visibly Too fast for read, he's gotta crank the sensitivity Heart rate, pressure, pulse, better not skip a beat Alchemy of science, magic or the wizardry Show the source, let us see how they play Or I'll just disassemble and drop a zero day A red herring flaw, lacking reasons for the claims Defeated in these games, so I'm seeking neon rain Who's the best rap group in Nerdcore? In the iTunes store? That's us, Dual Core Who makes the best beats? Rocking on the boards, produce a high score C64 Who's the best rapper that's known to spit crazy? And maybe kick babies Interrupt 80? And the number one hacker, the infamous legend who brings the end map Armageddon. Gregory Evans? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank so, you so much. That was the best introduction ever. <laughs> Thank you. So without further ado, it's my pleasure. And without further laptop hacks or rage or frustration, it's my pleasure to introduce Rain and U Urban Monkey. Uh, and they're going to show you some really cool lie detector polygraph stuff. Make some noise for them, please. Thank you so much, Anita. You totally rock my world. Thank you so much. That was so awesome. And thank you guys for waiting. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I assume you guys all know by now that you're in uh, build a lie detector, beat a lie detector. Um, I'm, we are both from the Neuro Numerous group. Joe Bear couldn't make it this year, so Urban Monkey uh, took the bullet and came instead. Um, and as I told you, this is actually my fifth year here speaking at DEF CON. So, Five years, so, y you know, some people get paper and stuff. I, I get a nerdcore, it's nerdcore uh, rap traditional for your introduction for your fifth year speech. So, but to uh, tell you the truth, I really almost didn't make it this year. Now, I know that NeuroNumerous every year, there comes with the madness of pulling things off at the last minute. That is part of our charm. Uh, but truth be told, I really wasn't feeling it this year. So, for several reasons, I've become so disillusioned with the whole concept of neurohacking that I actually wanted to uh, quit it completely. So, my dear friend and fellow member, Tottenkoff, who I know is here somewhere, um, she told me that the problem is I've just been pushing myself too hard lately, working on these year-long projects to bring to you guys. So, um, she actually suggested to me that I take this year off. Um, and um, so, since I've accidentally ended up in the shoes of being NeuroNumerous' spokesperson, it really didn't go over well with the rest of the group that I wanted to take a year off. Because how it works is we start working on our projects. As soon as I walk off this stage, we will be working on the next project. So it was really unfair to Urban Monkey and the rest of the group that I was like, I'm out. So a huge argument started with how much obligation I actually had to the group. And this caused a major riff. The infighting was crazy. Um, and the polygraph project actually ended up in the back burner for uh, many, many months while this was going on. So finally, Psychedelic Bike, who's painfully brilliant, by the way, he's a painfully brilliant man, he came up with a solution, a way that I could both take a year off and still be a spokesperson for the group. And it was really simple. The idea was we would just build a robot to download my memories into, and no one would be the wiser, while the real Rain stayed home eating bonbons and having a well-deserved rest. So at what point did you figure out I was lying to you? Was there something subtle that seemed off in my story before it obviously went down the path of the improbable? Did my body language tip you off? Did I show any stress gestures? Was I blinking? Swallowing too hard, fidgeting. I'm always fidgeting, so I mean. Um, did my story lack in detail? How about my vocal pitch? Was there anything off about that? 
too many pauses perhaps? Then again, how much of what I just told you was a lie? All of it? Some of it? None of it? More than three decades of uh, psychological research has shown that most individuals are horribly bad at figuring out when they're being lied to. The average person does barely any better than chance. Um, but you, don't, you can't blame them because there's no universal, unique, telltale sign that someone is lying to you, no matter what you've heard. Uh, but don't feel too downheartened about it. Um, even if you are a police officer, or a judge who had been trained in the art of detecting deception, the training might improve your accuracy, but it would only be a few percentage points at the most. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that detecting lies is complicated, because lies themselves are complicated things. A lie is not in the words we say, after all, or even in the lack of words. It's in the intention of the deceiver. However offensive this concept may be to you, deception comes naturally in all living things. Camouflage being only one of the many examples of how nature amply rewards successful deceivers by allowing them to survive long enough to mate and reproduce. According to the calculations made by a psychologist at the University of Southern California, human beings are lied to about 200 times a day. That works out to roughly one untruth every five minutes. So figure out what the last one I just told you was. Next slide. So, Throughout history, the truth has been a slippery thing for us to put our fingers on. And the progress of the human race has always been darkened by the self-made horrors of humans designed, found within severe mental and physical pain, that one group of human beings can seemingly without remorse or judgment uh, put another group of human beings to in the name of justice. So, from ancient times to the Middle Ages, Germanic laws were essentially unwritten tribal customs that evolve from popular practice that move with the tribe. If property was stolen or someone was injured or killed, a payment would be made um, to the guilty person to pay the victim or the families of the owner of property. This payment was a price that was considered amends. I'm sure you've all heard of blood money. So uh, that was to pay off to make amends. It was within Germanic law that the ordeal came to be a means by which the accused may clear themselves. Um, Tribal ordeal was a practice that the guilt or innocent of the accused was determined by subjecting them to unpleasant, usually a dangerous experience. In some cases, the accused was considered innocent if they survived the test or if their, if their injuries healed. In other cases, only death was considered proof of innocence. The reasoning went that those who had done nothing wrong would be kept from harm by divine intervention. Even if the accused happened to die during the ordeal, it was still considered at the time to be entirely fair because everyone knew that they'd go on to a suitable reward or punishment in the afterlife. Trials for ordeal became rare over the Middle Ages because it was often uh, replaced by confessions under torture. Um, so you can decide whether or not that was a trade-up. Uh, but the practice was discontinued only in the 16th century. So, sorry about my slides being cut off. Um, nobody reads them anyway, we all know that. Uh, trial by combat was a method of dramatic law to settle accusations in the absence of witnesses or a confession, in which two parties in dispute fought against each other in combat, and the winner of the fight was proclaimed to be right. So it remained in use uh, throughout the Middle Ages, gradually disappearing in the course of the 16th century, like trial by ordeal. But interestingly enough, trial by ordeal is generally known in one form or another in many cultures worldwide. And um, trial by combat was probably a custom of the Germanic people. Now to the Greeks and the Romans, the truth was something impersonal, separate from, and greater than an individual. And most certainly greater than an individual who is of low status or had been born into a captive birth. <laughs> the truth was thought to, be, to reside not only in the witness's words, but to be locked within their living flesh. And it was the torturer's task to pry out it through the medium of pain. Now, I know to you that the belief of extreme pain was a guarantee of the truth seems crazy counterintuitive uh, because to us today, because our instincts tell us that a tortured witness would agree to absolutely anything. But what you need to understand that is that our present view is rooted in the very modern philosophical sense that the individual self, as an autonomous being, is in the possession of its own truth. Now, 
The invention of the police did not come without growing pains, and early uh, American police departments were typically brutal and corrupt. During the early part of the 20th century, the routine torture used by American domestic police when it came to dealing with deception was given the quaint nickname of the third degree. Confessions obtained by using such techniques as bright lights, deprivation of food, physical discomfort, long isolation, and beating with instruments that didn't leave marks uh, were usually immiscible in court as long as someone signed a piece of paper that was a waiver saying that they had done it voluntarily. Between the 1930s and the 1960s, a national uproar actually began, uh, and, that, uh, and they started cracking down on police tactics and gradually changed the practice of police interrogation. So by the 1950s, uh, the confessions were considered involuntary, not only if the police had actually harmed the suspect, but had also caused what they considered mental harm by depriving them of sleep, food, water, or bathroom facilities. Promised them some benefit if the subject confessed or threatened them with harm if they didn't confess. In the world today, we rely on a legal system to sort our, our liars from our truth tellers. Two of the most commonplace legal systems are the adversarial system and the inquisitorial system. I'm going to hate saying that through the whole speech. Inquisitorial, inquisitorial. Um, in the adversarial system, two or more opposing parties gather evidence and present the evidence. This is a bad stapling job. Present the evidence and the arguments to a judge or jury. The judge or jury knows nothing of the, the litigation until the parties present their case to the decision makers. The defendant in a criminal trial is not required to testify. But in the inquisitorial system, the presiding judge is not a passive uh, recipient of the information. Rather, the presiding judge is primarily responsible for supervising and gathering the evidence necessary to resolve the case. He or she actively steers the search for evidence and questions the witness, including the respondents or defendants. Uh, attorneys play a more passive role, and they suggest routes of inquiry for the presiding judge to follow the judge questioning, and then they follow it with a tiny bit of questioning of their own. The reason the attorneys don't question too much is, and is very brief is because the judge tries to ask all the relevant questions. So they're kind of just add-ons. So basically, the adversarial system, which of course is the system in America, seeks the truth by pitting parties against each other in a hope that competition will reveal uh, uh, the truth. And it places a premium, right, like, a premium on the individual's rights. But the inquisitorial system seeks the truth by questioning those most familiar to the events in dispute and placing the rights of the accused secondary for the search of the truth. So as you can see, our efforts as a society have changed through the years in the way that we treat those that we believe to deceive us. But since the early 1900s, science has endeavored to create more human, a more human method to unravel the tales of deceivers. So, sorry. the modern polygraph as we know it was developed near the end of the 1920s uh, and would change very little over the coming decades. Its creators were not the first people to use scientific instrumentation as an aid in detecting lies or monitoring blood pressure during questioning. In fact, they weren't even the first to use the word polygraph to describe the device. They were, however, the first to put it in a portable form for use in the field and the first to design and market specifically for police application. Another thing that made this particular polygraph attractive was that it could potentially replace the existing brutal third degree method which had been brought to the public's attention through media during the first couple of decades of the 1900s. Such bad publicity had been putting a great deal of public pressure on police departments. Initially, the polygraph was limited to a small number of police departments, but its use slowly spread along with its reputation. There was little attention focused on the polygraph by the general media in the 1920s, though a few articles published were almost always positive. During the 1930s, use of the lie detector began to slowly move into other areas of use, with a ghoulish example being its use on death row inmates uh, being given exams as a consideration uh, when determining a stay of execution. Um, 
the use of the machine though was still mainly limited to